So, um, all right, Feedback Friday continuing here on Mackie and Judd. This batch, by the way, this next batch of feedback presented in part by our friends at Federated Mutual Insurance Company. They've been around for over 100 years, almost as long as the Minnesota Vikings have gone without winning a Super Bowl, unfortunately. That's only been 60 years. I kid. Why'd you have to? Why'd you have to go there? <laughs> we just want to win, win a damn Super Bowl. Go get one. All right. Uh, so Federated's all about risk management, tools and resources, face-to-face relationships to help elevate your business. Federated's been around, like I said, uh, since the early 1900s, based in Owatonna, Minnesota. Find out more about how they can help your business at federatedinsurance.com, where it's our business to protect yours. Daniel Sanchez chimes in here and says, I'd like to somewhat challenge the narrative on Adam Thielen and the talk of moving on from him. Though he's certainly not what he once was, he's still a great wide receiver too. Among wide receivers, he ranks 17th in receptions, 19th in first downs, and 32nd in yards. A far cry from his better seasons, but there aren't 32 wide receivers better than him. Yeah, I don't like I don't think the bar should be like you don't like line up one through 32 and then the number two wide receivers are ideally you would like to have two. If you're, if this is a high octane offense, your goal isn't to have a wide receiver that's ranked in the top three. And then another one that's ranked like 35th. Ideally you'd want one that's ranked first. And then another one that's ranked like 12th or something. If you really want an explosive offense. And I would say that, um, you know, a guy that is ranked 32nd in yards. Some of these, some of these are kind of skewed. Like his ability to separate in his route running, you can just see it has eroded a lot the last two or three years. I would frame it this way for Daniel. Imagine how great the Vikings offense would be if Thielen was your number three. If he was like possession guy, red zone guy, reliable guy, but you weren't asking him to get separation down the field 25 yards on a 23-year-old cornerback for the Lions or something, right? So what if, like, how much better would he be, too, if there was a receiver that was sort of above him on the peck? He'd he'd probably have three more years left on his career at a reasonable price if he could negotiate that, if they had a better receiver on the team that could take some of the pressure off what he, I mean, he can't do the things that you need out of a number two wide receiver. It's just, it's, it's a fact. I love stats. I love stats in all sports, but I also hate them. And it's because of things like this. Thielen is, yes, and we I continue to say this. He has great hands. He will have he will probably have great hands to catch footballs until the day he passes because he has he has a God-given ability to catch the ball. But if you watch the games, this offense needs a compliment to Jefferson. And that compliment is another guy who has the potential to stretch the field to run go routes, and who can run efficiently enough to provide a threat. The Vikings right now, and Osborne's not getting that chance, and and that does not mean he's bad, okay? So hear me clearly here. That does not mean he's bad, but the eye test says that the Vikings, to have the offense that they probably want, need a guy, and keep in mind, go back and look at the 2021 Rams, okay? Cooper Cup had some compliments there. Jefferson needs the same type of of thing. And Thielen compliments the offense. I'm not saying he doesn't. But, yeah, Phil, you nailed it by saying, imagine if you had two guys that were threats, and now it's like, oh, my God, oh, my God, they might throw to this guy. At some point in time, Thielen's inability to run and create separation is going and has become, I shouldn't say it's going to, it has become an issue. So, yeah, but this is – why does it always have to like come down to we're, we're ripping a player or criticizing him? All we're doing is basically having the same conversations that teams do, which is, okay, this isn't necessarily the fundamental guy who's going to bring out the best in Jefferson because a team is paranoid about the fact that um, our other, our fictional number two receiver might run a go route and now you got problems. That's all, all right. we're saying. Something else to look at too here. You got to be a little careful with like some of these back of the football card numbers because they yeah. can be deceiving. I mean, like Larry Fitzgerald on three win Cardinals teams was still racking up a thousand yards at age 34 or whatever. Not because he was elite. Oh, he, he's got a thousand yards. It, it, he was averaging like nine yards a catch. The top receivers in the league average about 15 yards a catch. Justin Jefferson. 
if you're sitting at 10 yards a catch or below, it's not scheme. It's speed. It's it's other things. I mean, sometimes it could be scheme in some ways because you're not being asked to, like, maybe run routes on the intermediate or right uh, down the field. Right. But Adam Thielen at his peak, the peak version of Thielen that we remember from, like, five or six years ago was averaging 14 yards a catch. And now it's 10. And that's the key stat, right? Like, it's scheme if you've always been a, a guy who catches the dink and dunks. Then it's probably scheme. But, and and the important thing to keep in mind, too, in the case of Thielen, Fitzy, it, across the board, these guys don't lose their ability to catch. Their hands don't go. Their mm-hmm. legs do. Yeah. If you were to tell me, hey, next year, sorry, KJ Osborne, love you, but uh, you had your chance to kind of step up and fill a void, and you just didn't in 2022. The Vikings are going to have Justin Jefferson as their number one. They're going to have some, at this point, unknown free agent or draft pick that can stretch the field a a big-time home run threat number two. Not a guy that's going to catch 80 passes, but a guy that's going to catch like 53 passes and average 16, 17 yards per catch because he's stretching the field. Yep. And Adam Thielen cleaning up all the other stuff. Hey, we need you five times a game on a third and seven to just find a spot in a zone, and we need you to find a spot in the red zone. You're not being asked to do anything beyond that. Anything beyond that's gravy. He's your number three. They'd be overpaying for it, but your offense would be so <laughs> I'm just gonna, I'm just much better. Say, yeah, <laughs> He's going to be 33 years old next year. You know, this is the other thing too, okay? Remember back, I don't know, some, some of the listeners and viewers of this show might be a little young for this, but I remember... I grew up on Chris Carter, and Chris Carter was incredible, even into his mid-30s. But there comes a point, and for Chris, it didn't really happen until he was like probably 35 or 36. Thielen's like 33, where you start watching even these legendary players. You're like, boy, that guy literally can't even like outrun a defensive tackle anymore. But his hands – so what happened with Carter at the end, and again, it was a, a few years later. I think Carter maybe just if he just avoided some of the big hits, like Thielen has been much more banged up. I feel like in his career, just taking bigger hits or whatever, like Carter, Carter, like never missed games for it feels like he's been years. hurt way more. Yes. I agree. Yep. With that. And so as Carter's speed and he was never the burner that Moss was in his prime, but as his speed went completely away, guess what he could still do reach his hands out on the sideline and catch yeah. a dart from, you know, Dante Culpepper or whoever. So, Thielen's always going to have those hands, like you said. But once the speed starts to go away, it's um, it's tough to rely on that guy as a number one or number two wide receiver. So, do you do you remember when Carter came back with the Dolphins and, and he had gained a bunch of weight and it was just so sad? Yeah, well, he had signed a five hundred thousand uh, dollar HBO broadcast contract. Yeah, and then got he just like got got a call from the Dolphins and said, okay, yeah, sure. But he came back and he was like gained twenty pounds, and it's like, oh, dude, yeah. no, go back to TV. Yep, don't do let's, this. Let's let's see here. Paul Smith says one quote that would sum up Ed Donatel's defense is insanity is doing the same thing over and over and expecting different results. Yep. A quote attributed to Albert Einstein, but Einstein the dog from Back to the Future could see the problems <laughs> the Vikings currently have on defense. We can all see the issues, but our defensive coach is too stubborn to do anything to address the debacle that is our defense. Our personnel is good enough to be a top 15 defense, but they're either being badly coached or badly schemed. I would suggest both. Yeah. Um, So, and my question for Saturday's game against the Colts is this, is what Ed Donatel said at the press conference on Wednesday going to be reflected in that game plan? Because if it is, it's a problem. Or, or is Ed being defensive publicly, but behind the scenes, we are go- going to see tweaks. I don't expect massive changes. Okay, like I don't think to, I don't think to a lot of, of us the changes, if they have incorporated them, are going to be like, oh, look at that, they're running a completely different uh, scheme, and but more pressure, um, more man, which means, which means not playing zone, which I think that they want to do. It's stuff like that. Um, I do agree, I, I think, with your point, Phil, on PD, which is tomorrow is going to be super interesting to see what really takes place. Like, mm-hmm. that game, to me, is going to tell you a lot. 
Uh, I have to think that behind the scenes, especially from what he said publicly, O'Connell has said, we need to get this right, or at least as right as possible. Yeah. Uh, but if they come out and they're doing the same stuff, then yes, it is complete insanity. And that Detroit game, I mean, to me, if you don't make uh, significant tweaks off of that, you're probably not going to. Yep. Take the fight. That's the one thing about those Mike Zimmer defenses for years and years. The double A gap blitzing and and allowing Xavier Rhodes to get physical with opposing wide receivers, right? It was they were very handsy. They would push the envelope. They would walk the line between penalties and not. They were they were always taking the fight to opposing offenses. And sometimes they get burned, but largely when you take the fight to opposing offenses and you put them sort of on their heels, you're gonna force them into making mistakes, incomplete passes, turnovers, etc. Yeah. It's like they're just kind of waiting for and it and they have they've generated turnovers this season even playing sort of a laid back on their heels approach but the turnover train when it runs out Detroit happens. Mm-hmm. Speaking of, <laughs> here's a comment from Kip, our guy Kip Nazda, loyal listener and viewer, Phil. I listened to the show on Monday and while I agree that the Vikings defense is a disaster, your take that the Lions are better than the Vikings is absurd. Is it? I guess uh, and you can fight ahead. me again on this if you want, but like you want to look at eye test Vikings versus Lions. The Vikings were down by two touchdowns the whole second half, basically. The Vikings were down by 10 in the fourth quarter of their first meeting. The Vikings lost to the Lions last year. They had to beat them at the buzzer in the win that they had last year. So I guess I don't know how you can watch the Vikings and Lions play each other the last two seasons and specifically this season and specifically last week and say it's absurd to say that the Lions are better than the Vikings. They are. I know the Lions have lost more games, but if you look at the last two months especially, just look at a snapshot of the last two months. I think the Lions have more wins than the Vikings do over the last two months. And if you want to look at some of the advanced like like Football Outsiders DVOA, which does basically uh, uh, it ranks teams based on their process. How good are they as you as you dig away? How good are they situationally? How good are they at moving the ball forward, et cetera, preventing the other team from moving? The Lions are the 11th ranked team in the NFL, according to Football Outsiders DVOA. The Vikings are actually, uh, let me scroll down here, 21st because they've just been so bad defensively and they've played so many close games and they keep, you know, finding ways to pull out the ends. I'm just saying, like, you can disagree, but to say it's absurd after watching what happened last week, I don't know. I mean, I know you disagree with me, Judd, so I just give you the last point on this. I wouldn't say absurd. Um, I guess I I don't know. I guess I, I need to see more body of work from both teams to, to see how, how this uh, plays out. I think since the Hawkinson trade, the Lions are now, if I'm not mistaken, if let's something like five and one and the Vikings are four and two, uh, the go. Lions have been hot and played well. And defensively, yes, uh, both of these teams are messes. Offensively, I like what Goff has done. I like Kirk mo- more than Goff long term. Uh, absurd, no. Do I think that the Vikings, w- would I take the Vikings right now? Yes, I would. The other thing is like the Kirk Goff thing. I know Goff's. Goff's floor has been lower than Kirk's floor over the last six. We've seen like a really bad version of Goff, but people, I would take Kirk over Goff too. But I think was it Declan or somebody asked who would you who would you trust more in the playoffs? I said, oh, I I have to trust Goff more because I've seen I've seen Goff drive a car, a very good car, to the Super Bowl. Got him through. Yep. And Kirk has not. So people act like it's like, oh, Goff is garbage. Of course you'd take Kirk. Well, Goff has accomplished more in his career than Kirk has. So you want to you want to credit the circumstances oh around God. and blame the circumstances oh. around the other guy? Oh, Just I saying. can hear the Crusaders opening up their Gmails right it's now. It's true. They're drafting their it's Gmails. True. It's starting like this. <laughs> hey, Mackie. <laughs> Why it's don't you take true. your Goff Kirk comparison and, sh- and shove it where the sun don't shine? Dude, when Goff is given good infrastructure, coaching that he trusts, a scheme and some weapons, which is what we ask for for Kirk too, right? He does a pretty damn good job. People, for the first two years of him with McVay, people were talking about him as like, whoa, this is one of the next five or six best quarterbacks in the league once the old guard fades out. And then we all wrote him off after the Rams dumped him for Stafford. And McVay did too. Yep, he did. 
he did. He and, did and, write it, them off. and it paid off. But now, like, he's having a good season again, and he's a huge reason why the Lions are co- coming back. So, again, I would take Kirk over Goff, but sometimes people just, like, well, oh, oh, you know, this guy's garbage and Kirk is a god. It's like, no, well, <laughs> that's not true. And in this league, for the majority of teams, how many teams can you compare and say it's absurd? Like, this that's league a, yeah. is very close. Yeah, take the Eagles, Chiefs, Cowboys, and at this point, probably 49ers off the top. But and even then, them, you don't know for sure, right? Like, it's very close. I know for sure that those teams are, like, head and shoulders above the league. Right now, right. But like, but I wouldn't like like. Would, but would the Lions give some of those teams a fight? Yeah, the Lions give the Eagles a fight, right? Yep. In Week One. Yep. It's a long time ago, but uh, Danny Buck chimes in here and says, "My name is Danny Buck. Hey, Danny. I'm a long I'm a long time listener. Love you guys. Y'all do an amazing job. Just letting you know, my wife and I are coming up there to watch Vikings Colts. Nice. All the way from Tennessee. Would love to know if there's any chill bars around the stadium." I'm looking forward to drinking plenty of Surly. Well, you should definitely go to Surly, which is not near the stadium. It's a couple it's miles far, away. No. Yeah, Easy Uber far. ride or light rail. You could do light rail if you want to. Yep. So definitely check that. I, you check out Park Tavern as well. That's not close to the stadium, but it's a great chill bar. The, this is the home of sports dad, though. Yep. St. Louis Park. Uh, I, you Park know what? Tavern. I don't think, I don't know at this point in time, how, how many bars are near the stadium? Because the, the old Hubert's, which came Eric the Red, has been closed for like a year and a half now. Yeah. I don't think that there's, like, there's bars in the periphery, but I don't think that there's any, like, bars right by the stadium. It's no. basically he, apartments and condos. Go down a mile. You can go, Red Rabbit's a great, you go go down by, like, the warehouse district, the North Loop area. Go to Red, go to, like, a Red Rabbit for a chill little uh, brunch situation. Charcuterie plate. Charcuterie board. Oh. Fantastic. Oh. Go get it. I would start there and then just like hop in an Uber or hop on a scooter or something and just work your way down. I mean, the snow is probably going to prevent you from doing a scooter. Oh, no. show is not Uber. suggesting scooters for anybody. <laughs> I that love scootering. I love scootering personally. We don't know how old Danny Buck is. What do you mean he might be older? He, he could be. Old. We don't know. He could be nineteen for all we do know. You want to read 19. an obit? Danny Buck came into town for the Vikings Colts game. <laughs> <laughs> and perished on a scooter. Do you want to read that old bit? Danny, take an Uber. Alan Whitley says, Mackie, I'm a huge Vikings fan from New Jersey. Love the shows you guys put on Score North. Can you please find out the opponent's average separation on receptions? It seems like every catch an opponent makes, they are wide open, like no one is within three to five yards of them. Looking forward to hearing your opinions about this. So I don't have that specific stat for you, but we've gone over this a couple times the middle of the field is largely just a wide open void that you could just walk into if you're an opposing skill position player. So I'll try and track something like that down, like defensive yards of separation. It's a great, I love that question. Trust your eyes. Trust your eyes. It's a great question though. Mm -hmm. I bet the Vikings are bottom three in the league. That's my well, guess. Well, three of their worst players in coverage are Eric Kendricks, Jordan Hicks, and Chandon Sullivan. Right. Those are the three guys that are largely responsible for the middle of the field. Although, you know, look, let's delve into that a little bit because I do find it to be intriguing. So, so with the defensive system that they play, you know, the players always look at times like they're totally at fault, right? It's like, oh, well, Hicks was supposed to be there and he wasn't. Yeah. But you know, they're also playing they're also playing their scheme and their keys. And and I think once in a while for sure, i.e. I. the first big touchdown pass by Goff on Sunday, it's just a screw up. Somebody screwed up. Like somebody didn't do their job and it got lost or the entire team didn't. But you know, with the amount of passes that we see underneath that go completed, that's where I struggle with the scheme. Um, there are certainly times for sure where Hicks is slow, but is it every time? Like that's what it appears, but is that fair? And that's where I would love to know where the rubber meets the road of this scheme. It's definitely encouraging some short shots that are almost sure things. And, and unless you actually sat down with the coaching staff and saw it, I think it's hard to, to tell exactly what's on the players at times and what's on the scheme. and, And the player is actually 
doing his job, but looks foolish. Yes. I'm going to give you, I'll give you this one here. Okay. This is from pro football focus. I'm just kind of curious. I wanted to see who are the best coverage linebackers in the NFL. And um, it looks like Dre Greenlaw from San Francisco, Levante David from Tampa Bay. Let's, let's just take, see, some of this is about preventing yards after the catch. If you're a linebacker, like, mm-hmm. T, or t, let's use T.J. Edwards from uh, Philadelphia. He's in here too. So, for instance, T.J. Edwards, when targeted in the Philadelphia scheme as an inside linebacker, he holds opposing quarterbacks to a 58% completion percentage and 6.5 and yards per catch. So 58%, 6.5 yards per, per catch. Okay. Jordan Hicks is 77% completion percentage and 13 yards per catch. So near so nearly double the yards per catch. Eric Hendricks 10 yards per catch, 75% completion percentage. So those guys allowing especially Jordan Hicks twice as many yards per catch compared to one of the top coverage linebackers, what percentage of that is scheme and age and just ability? Because T.J. Edwards is 26 years old, right? That's right. That's that's prime, uh, and that's where my knowledge ends. Like I'm not. We need someone smarter to say like it's a 70 percent scheme, 30 percent Jordan Hicks is a fossil, and that's right. why. Right. But I mean, the, the so so I think one thing that we can safely say is this: the Vikings are being out coached and out schemed at times on that side of the ball. And I don't think that that's a, a debate there are, because when you are, when you are not a really adaptable defensive or uh, offensive mind, teams are going to exploit things. And once that's exploited, you have to adjust or everyone is going to exploit it. And it feels like, and this goes, this goes back to old school football coaches. They feel no, my scheme works. And, and the players aren't, aren't essentially executing the correct keys okay, that's a fine thing to say, but it's your job to then put them in a position to counter the adjustment. And I mean, that's sports, right? Like mm-hmm. the best coaches adjust. I feel like O'Connell offensively adjusts some things yeah. fairly quickly. Yep. And he's not perfect, but at, at least I feel that that way. I don't know that Ed... So the dangerous thing about Ed is this. So he knew the guy that installed this. So he knows Vic. And Fangio installed this, and Ed was his DC, but he didn't call the plays. So in doing so, Ed knows what he saw worked, right? But Vic Fangio for sure probably adjusted things constantly, Mm -hmm. tweaked things constantly. But when you know the guy and you're not the guy, are you able to make those adjustments on the fly? And Mm -hmm. that's where I think that's where I think you separate a head coach from a coordinator from a position coach. Yep. And that those are the things that are it's 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 hard to know unless you're sort of in the room yeah. hearing what they're discussing. Mm-hmm. Joseph Cheek says, I love your show and all the work you guys put in to give us amazing Vikings content. Thank you, Joseph. It may be a little far fetched, but here uh, but is there a chance the Vikings are staying vanilla in defensive play calling on purpose? Maybe once they figured out that they have the division wrapped up, basically, they want to put as little on film as possible. Knowing that they don't have the strongest defense, they know that surprise is going to be the key when it comes to the playoffs. I don't think it's very likely, but it's one of the things that may make sense in my mind. Is it possible that they that they have some adjustments that they don't want to show until January? If that was the case, it would be like an adjustment or two, but you wouldn't allow this to continue to happen. They're being embarrassed. I mean, and they still like they still haven't clinched anything yet. Yeah, like the, you exactly. Know, you gotta... But I mean, there's no way that there's no way that you would if if you had the magic elixir to fix four consecutive or five consecutive games of 400 plus yards, you're not going to ho- hold back. Now, are there certain? Is there a package or two that you might unveil? Absolutely. Yeah. But no, you're not allowing yourself to get gashed and embarrassed consistently to come out in the first playoff game and be like, oh, my God, they're the mid-70s Steelers on defense. Yes. Um, if you're embarrassed about your weight, mm. you don't have to be. I mean, you can feel however you want to feel, but you can fix it. You can fix it before January 1st, in fact. Yes, and I am t- telling you right now, give yourself the gift of good health 
and do it right now. My friends, Livia Weight Control Centers is waiting for your call. They are they are a weight control center. That's the important thing. This is not a quick fix diet. This is a way to lose weight. In fact, what a year plus ago now, I shed 40 pounds. And most importantly, it is your way or your ticket, I should say, to keeping that weight off. Join their award-winning program now, and you save 50%, 50%. Consultations, well, if you're in town here, they have uh, they have um, places that you can go in and talk to a dietitian. If you're not in town, though, guess what? Virtual visits are an option. So start to lose that weight today. How? 855-GO-L-I-V-E-A, 855-GO-L-I-V-E-A, Livia.com livia.com and again 50% off give yourself that that most important holiday gift and that is good health visit livia.com all right that's a wrap on this feedback friday edition of Mackie and judd don't forget vikings vent line on the purple daily youtube channel right after vikings colts finish up on saturday the most fan-friendly interactive show in all of minnesota sports Thanks to AJ for hanging out in place of Declan. Today you can find him on the Taxi Squad podcast, the Scorner Taxi Squad. We'll see you guys next week on Mackie and Judd.